Okay, I think we're gonna get started, guys. Uh, first of all, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Elena Bailey, and this is uh, one of five webinars that we're planning on doing uh, between now and the Biosolids National Conference. And uh, if some of you attended the WEFTEC workshop that we did on utilities of the future focused on biosolids, two of our speakers were Sudhir Murthy and Bruce Johnson. And we're glad to have them to discuss one of the topics that you requested that we add additional information and, and expand on that topic. So I will be the moderator for the day. Um, we recommend that you send in your questions in the Q&A button. Uh, you're all on mute. Uh, so if you can start sending in whatever questions you have through that button, then at the very end, I will be able to ask our speakers the questions. Um, the, the main idea, it will be Sudhir will start first, and he talks about the background of the technology, then we move on to Bruce, and then we actually would show some case studies, and at the very end, we'd be able to go through the Q&A. So with that, I would like to introduce Sudhir Murthy from DC Water. He's part of and leading the innovation team, as you know, at DC Water. And uh, with that, Sudhir, you... Uh, and, and obviously Bruce Johnson, but I'll come back and I'll introduce Bruce again from ch 2 Hill. Uh, both of these gentlemen have been very instrumental with this technology. Um, you would see that Sudhir was originally in the team that came up with the technology and Bruce. Uh, we're very pleased to have him as a speaker because he actually designed the very first installation in North America. So before we get into the, the Q&A and anything else, um, I actually would like to ask uh, the first question from all of you guys. And if you just answer why you're here, you know, to learn more about the technology, potential, evaluating technologies, what are the reasons for what, um, we're gonna do only three polling questions. So this is the first one. Following Sudhir's portion, we'll do another one, and then when Bruce finishes off, we'll do one more. So um, I'm gonna allow the polling to uh, accumulate for one minute, so we're 30 seconds into it. So hopefully I can get 100% of all of you attending uh, to respond, and then I would share that with you. So we got uh, 10 more seconds, so if you haven't responded, uh, please uh, just put in whatever you think best applies for you. And right now we got almost uh, pretty good to almost 100% participation. We're getting pretty close. So this is the results. Basically, the majority of you wanted to learn more about the technology and evaluating other technologies. So 92%, thanks a lot. So stop sharing results. And with that, I wanna turn it over to Sudhir. Sudhir, ready to go? Yep, thank you, Elena. Good morning, everyone. I uh, uh, hope you all are having a very good morning. Uh, I wanted to introduce uh, this technology, um, and, and, and my role in this uh, webinar is really uh, uh, that, that exactly that, uh, provide an introduction to the technology, describe its evolution, uh, and, and most importantly, uh, to try and provide the framework of why one would consider using it. Um, uh, we, we started looking at this technology uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, it actually preceded my uh, time at DC Water. Uh, I was a uh, PhD student in the 1990s at Virginia Tech uh, with, with John Novak uh, when we first started looking at this whole concept of uh, digestion of sludges uh, under anaerobic conditions and, and, and under aerobic conditions. And what we found was, uh, was when you digested sludge uh, in, in, in anaerobic conditions, you, you, 
you were uh, one one was actually uh, destroying a, a different fraction of sludge compared to that under aerobic condition. And so our early experiments started uh, to combine the two to see if we could increase uh, overall volatile solids reduction. Uh, we did some experiments uh, also with uh, thermophilic digestion or uh, thermophilic aerobic digestion and uh, and uh, and mesophilic aerobic digestion but uh, but in general what we saw was uh, uh, was was the rheology of the sludge was different enough under these two different conditions that uh, that we saw higher volatile solids uh, reduction overall uh, since then uh, after joining dc water uh, uh, dc water being a nutrient removal facility uh, we were also interested uh, uh, thereafter in uh, looking at nitrogen removal uh, associated with this post aerobic digestion. Uh, a few other reasons why one might consider post aerobic digestion and we'll, I'll, I'll describe that in, in, in the future slides is, uh, is really all about uh, whether uh, you want a certain type of product quality in terms of odors and in terms of how, how that product looks, uh, but, 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 but certainly also if, if you want to manage uh, dewatering associated with the biosolids. Uh, our, our work uh, uh, that, that we did uh, jointly with uh, John Novak at Virginia Tech, uh, uh, in, in, in some of our er earliest work, showed that uh, uh, with, with post aerobic digestion, you could get as much as 65% overall VS destruction and, uh, and, and uh, at least uh, a 10% a 10% point increase in VS destruction, a minimum of 10% point increase in VS destruction over the uh, preceding anaerobic digestion process. We also started looking at uh, ammonia removal. Our target at that time was to get 90% ammonia removal. That's a reasonable target for site stream treatment. And, uh, and we saw, uh, we observed uh, that we could get the ammonia down from say a 2,500 milligram per liter uh, in, in, the, in the filtrate to as, as low as 200 milligram per liter. Uh, and, and, and this was achieved in a six day SRT. So what is aerobic digestion followed by anaerobic digestion? It's really a, a, a tank uh, that can, uh, in which you aerate the sludge uh, that comes out of an anaerobic digestion process. And uh, once you aerate the sludge uh, and, and make it aerobic, really this, uh, the product uh, in the tank and out, out of the tank is, is, is as good as an aerobic product. It, it doesn't smell like an anaerobic product. It doesn't have any ammonia type odors or anaerobic odors. It's really an aerobic product that, that, that's in the tank. And so in many cases, you, you don't need odor, uh, odor uh, control for, for that aerobic process, as well as the product is, uh, is nice and aerobic. So it, it, it can produce a, a compost-like product, especially if you're looking at uh, a class A product with soil amendment. So uh, 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 in, 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 in the case of uh, this post aerobic digestion, you can do it nitrification only, uh, so you can uh, fully aerate it. However, if you just uh, aerate it by itself, you need, need alkalinity. And so the strategy really is to use the carbon associated with that VS destruction, that 10 percentage points I talked about. And if you use the carbon associated with with that additional VS destruction, then you can get denitrification. And so this combined nitrification and denitrification can be done uh, in, in one of two modes. You can do it intermittent. Uh, you can increase the air and decrease the air uh, associated with that process, or you can uh, poise it at a certain uh, a low DO condition uh, to get this combined nitrification and denitrification. And, uh, and, and the benefits are uh, that you don't need the additional side stream treatment uh, for nitrogen removal. Uh, you have no chemical addition, so you don't need any carbon or alkalinity associated with uh, uh, the nitrification process of alkalinity and denitrification process of the carbon. And, 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 uh, uh, and, and, and it's, it's not a one trick pony. So you have, uh, you have uh, multiple tricks uh, up, 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 up the sleeve there. You have additional volatile solid destruction. You can get nitrifier bio augmentation. Uh, in some cases, uh, if, you, if you so desire, you can get struvite stabilization. Uh, and again, under certain conditions, you can uh, improve your dewatering and polymer dose and, uh, and cake solids and, 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 and biosolids odor reduction, which, by the way, was a, a real big uh, a reason uh, for, uh, for our digestion process at Blue Twins. 
Next slide, please. Um, I think we may have missed a slide, but uh, what 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 does it look like? So uh, the post aerobic digestion process uh, uh, is between five to ten days of uh, SRT. Uh, you can do it uh, in a uh, secondary digester. So if you have an old secondary digester, um, uh, you can you can reuse the tankage uh, and 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 use it for post aerobic digestion. So it can serve as both a holding tank and an aerobic digester. Uh, it's it's uh, from an equipment perspective. Uh, what you need is really the the typical equipment that that you use for aerobic digestion. And uh, I think uh, many of you know that Ovivo uh, uh, has has been building some of these aerobic digesters for quite some time. And uh, and 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 it's 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 the same equipment that you need for aerobic digestion. It is a heat generating process uh, because of the solids concentration that goes into the digestion uh, and, uh, and 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 uh, and 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 really the amount of energy that's there associated with the volatile solids uh, reduction uh, it's likely to produce heat and and especially in the summer you might uh, even need cooling uh, associated with that process and and as I said previously it can be done without odor control. Uh, the volatile solids reduction. Uh, the the post uh, and, and this this slide is really more about the rheology of that process. Uh, at a minimum, we've seen uh, a ten percent increase in uh, a volatile solids reduction under some conditions, depending on on the VSR or volatile solids reduction you have in the anaerobic digestion process. You can go go to as much as forty percent additional volatile solids reduction. Uh, the, the 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 VSR can increase also uh, based on how you configure the tankage. We evaluated several approaches where we combine anaerobic, aerobic, and and then uh, then anaerobic again uh, through a recycle stream uh, and and through recuperative thickening, and we were able to get uh, as much as 70% VS disruption. So that that's certainly possible. And uh, and associated with that, you can incre uh, increase the cake solids and and uh, and reduce the polymer dose. One one aspect that I wanted to touch upon uh, associated with cake solids and polymer dose is uh, is that uh, uh, the the increase in cake solids is really dependent on how you manage uh, uh, the magnesium associated uh, with 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 the sludge. Uh, what we have found is uh, if you uh, if you uh, remove the magnesium uh, associated with sludge in, by by moving towards biological phosphorus removal or for or, or, or struvite precipitation, uh, then then uh, uh, you you may not see that improvement in dewatering. But if you if you were to um, uh, dewater the sludge uh, in the absence of uh, some of those processes, uh, then then you see an increase in cake solids. Uh, the option also exists of adding magnesium. Uh, to manage the true white precipitation, and 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 then uh, and then you can see uh, some of those improvements in dewatering. Uh, we haven't uh, actually evaluated that uh, concept yet, but there is a WERF project uh, uh, that is evaluating that concept, and 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 we'd like to see some of those results. Uh, the pad uh, removes nitrogen uh, from uh, from the whole digested solid stream, uh, so it's it's really not a side stream treatment. Process per se because it's really doing it in that uh, main solid stream itself, and uh, and but but what it does is it uh, makes side stream treatment unnecessary. Uh, at Spokane County, where uh, uh, Bruce uh, led the uh, uh, led 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 the really this concept that was on on bench uh, to really uh, deliver it as a full scale viable project, uh, uh, the ammonia concentration in the effluent was. Uh, Less than 25 milligram per liter. I, I mentioned uh, about struvite stabilization. Uh, depending on how that uh, aerobic digester is operated, you can actually start forming these struvite crystals within the aerobic digestion tank itself. Uh, again, for 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 struvite, you need magnesium, you need ammonium, and you need phosphate. And 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 the way the aerobic digestion a process is operated uh, can can actually increase or decrease the amount of struvite form, but it can also increase and decrease the amount of biological phosphorus removal that can take place within within that tank. 
Uh, next slide. And, and so uh, one thing that slide also showed was uh, you can avoid the scaling associated with true white uh, in the downstream uh, dewatering process uh, by, by managing that aerobic digestion process uh, properly. Uh, in the context of bio augmentation, uh, the, uh, the, the digestion process is basically enriched with nitrifiers, both ammonia oxidizing bacteria and, and, and in many cases, the nitrite oxidizing bacteria. And, uh, and, and depending on how well your dewatering process performs, uh, uh, in, in many cases, poor, poor dewatering is, is a problem. Uh, in, 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 in the case of post aerobic digestion, if your dewatering process uh, returns some of the solids back to the, your uh, biological process, it actually can uh, serve as a nitrifier augmentation process as well. So uh, in many cases, under cold weather con conditions, uh, uh, and if, you, if if there isn't sufficient SRT, uh, this this can serve as a an option for biogmentation. Uh, DC water uh, evaluated uh, post aerobic digestion uh, in 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 the 2005 to 2010 uh, time period. Uh, we we had some publications associated with that technology in in that time period. Uh, we did not end up installing that technology only because uh, we had a very, very large program associated with thermal hydrolysis that was taking place uh, right in parallel. And uh, it was uh, something that we could not uh, put in place uh, alongside this new thermal hydrolysis technology. However, uh, uh, given, given all of the work Bruce has done uh, since then, uh, it is something that uh, we would have considered uh, if, if, if we had that opportunity once again. There are uh, uh, three facilities today, uh, and Bruce, this is really a slide where I, I'm going to hand it over to Bruce, uh, where, uh, where post-aerobic digestion is being uh, considered and, or performed, and, uh, and, and Bruce will uh, uh, describe uh, these three facilities in, in greater detail. And with that, uh, I'd ha hand it over to Ellen again. Uh, you wanted to ask the poll questions, Sudhir. You wanted yeah. to this from your point of view. So uh, I described uh, some of the reasons why one might consider uh, post aerobic digestion. Certainly, uh, uh, volatile solids reduction can reduce biosolids management costs. Side stream treatment can uh, re uh, uh, can uh, can can reduce the nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, certainly, there's approaches for struvite stabilization. Odor removal, you can get an aerobic product. There are opportunities to improve cake solids and polymer dose. And then, of course, depending on how uh, the aerobic digestion is configured, you can either meet uh, class B or class A biosolids condition. So uh, the question that I uh, have out here is, what is your biggest biosolids management concern at your, at your facilities? Or, or what are those con considerations that you would uh, take into account for uh, for this process, and if you could, uh, uh, it's a multiple choice uh, question. So if you could, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 Elena, can they pick more than one? Yes, they can. So so if you if you have more than one, just just uh, click click on them, and uh, and then uh, we can uh, show show your vote. Yeah, and I've got half of the people already responded so i'm waiting to get a few more as a percentage then i'll share the the questions yeah uh 10 more seconds So there is the result, Sudhir. Great. So it, it looks like about 60, um, uh, two thirds of the uh, reasons really is, uh, is, is nitrogen and phosphorus. Yep, it is. Yep, that's very good. Great. Okay, um, with that, we'll move on to Bruce. Thanks, Elena. Um, can you move to the next slide here? 
Um, thanks everyone for taking the time to talk about this uh, technology. And I, as Elena said, I'm gonna talk about some of the applications and design stuff that we've done. Uh, the first plant we did was at the Spokane County Regional Water Reclamation uh, Facility. It was the DBO plant that uh, CH2M did uh, back in 2011. Um, I've got a picture of our crew there that uh, without their extensive help on uh, figuring out this first time process, it would have uh, not gone as well as it, it did, but they, it was a great crew we had there. So we first started treating wastewater in 2011, and uh, this was the first full-scale pad in North America. There was one in Europe uh, that has since been decommissioned because they went to incineration out of it. Next slide. The process flow diagram at uh, Spokane is, uh, we start out with chemically enhanced primary treatment. Uh, Spokane actually has to get a 0.05 phosphorus out of it, so we hit pretty hard with the uh, iron there. This goes to a step feed bioreactor, and then to uh, membranes before being discharged. Um, waste solids uh, combine, uh, get co-thickened, and go to anaerobic digestion. Um, and then after anaerobic digestion, we go to a, a post-aerobic digester tank. Uh, where we get dewatering and then the centrate gets returned back to the head of the plant. Next slide. Um, so what we have there at Spokane is two parallel uh, mesophilic anaerobic digesters. They run between a 15 and 20 day SRT, pretty standard stuff. Uh, the pad afterward is a uh, five to 10 day SRT and uses coarse bubble aeration both during the aerobic and uh, uh, so-called anoxic period. Uh, we see the additional VS destruction. Um, the pad tank actually doubles as a solid storage tank. Uh, as we all know, it's pretty handy to have that uh, tank uh, after digestion. So we just double that up in the pad system and it uh, varies about uh, five foot in elevation as uh, they're doing their dewatering. Um, we remove the liquid phase inorganic nitrogen to less than about 50, um, depending on where it gets operated. And this is an integral part of the nutrient removal system at Spokane County. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, solids facilities there. We have uh, the two uh, silo anaerobic digesters, those are uh, tall and low diameter tanks. They actually go down quite deep below grade there. Um, got a combined thickening and dewatering building and to the upper right there, we have a post aerobic digester tank, uh, kind of a standard tank. You can see it's covered about 20 foot diam uh, 20 foot side water depth. And uh, then we do uh, gas storage and cogen there as well in the system. Next slide. Now, uh, first I'm gonna talk a little bit about the VS destruction in the pad tank. Um, we uh, looked at this a few different ways because we wanted to be really sure that we were seeing the numbers that we were seeing. The first way we looked at our VS destruction was uh, with the pad in and out of service and what was the observed yield at the plant? The uh, pounds of biosolids hauled per pound of influent BOD. Um, and you can see in this diagram there that when the pad's offline, that observed yield at the plant really does go up quite significantly uh, from you know around 0 0.2, 0 0.3 type range up to the 0.6 range uh, when the pad's offline. Pad came back online um, in May, and you know VS the yield dropped quite a bit. Went back off uh, for a few months uh, during uh, the startup period there, and it was went back up again. And then once we got it back in service, the pad uh, observed yield went back down again. So that was one good way of doing it. The next slide, what we did is we showed uh, a cumulative solids production at the plant. So this is the amount of biosolids hauled. Uh, this is actually the number I trust the most of any facility because people pay a lot of money to dispose of biosolids. 
So if you look at the slopes of the line, when the pad's offline, there's one steeper slope uh, to that line there. And when the pad's offline, you can see that that slope decreases, which is indicative of lower overall biosolids production. And uh, then again, we, it goes up again when the pad's offline, and that slope decreases again when the pad uh, is back into service. So you can see with, we've got two different ways of looking at it, and both show the improved VS destruction in the pad tank. Uh, then, of course, we've got the um, uh, pad uh, TIN removal, a total inorganic nitrogen is a combination of ammonia and nitrate and nitrite. Um, here we've got uh, averaged uh, for the last about six years, or five years maybe, I guess, um, average ammonia going into the pad process was about 900, and we got uh, 20 milligram per liter or less coming out on average, which is about a 98% ammonia removal efficiency there at Spokane. And uh, nitrates are typically 40 milligram per liter or less. That gave us an overall TIN removal of 96% um, in regular operation. Next slide. Now, as I alluded to, uh, the guys at the plant were critical in figuring out a whole bunch of challenges that uh, first time technology did when we did this back in 2011. Um, and uh, uh, one of the first ones we came up with was that um, the temperature, um, uh, the pad actually worked a lot better than what we had planned on there. And one of the side things of that is that we had a lot of heating going on in the pad tank because it was covered. Um, we didn't expect that much biological activity. And so um, what we had to do, we ended up doing two things. One was a good engineering aspect where we just cooled the air going into it with an inexpensive air water heat exchanger. But that wasn't quite enough. And uh, what the guys at the plant actually figured out is if they put some sprinklers on top of the aluminum lid in the summertime and ran them, it actually dropped the temperature in the pad tank about five degrees Celsius and got us right into the temperature we needed. Uh, so it was a really good uh, practical field implementation of a, of a cooling system there. Um, and of course, there's automation controls that can be used to deal with that. Uh, foaming, uh, when the pad's not happy for whatever reason, uh, too hot, uh, too variable, and, you know, a couple things, we can get foam. Uh, the foam, though, is very unstable and uh, will build up in the tank, but if you let it overflow someplace, you can let it overflow in a, a corner of a 70-foot diameter tank, and it, it just goes right down. So it's not a huge issue there at, at Spokane. Um, one of the uh, things that we do have to watch out for is pH control. Um, at Spokane County, what we found is that if you let the uh, pH go too high through higher ammonia, you could get into ammonia toxicity issues in the pad and actually kill it. Um, we address that by uh, putting in a sulfuric acid addition system after the fact has actually since not been used to my knowledge out there. So one good thing we put in that never needed ever more. So um, let's go to the next one. So um, what does this mean for facilities here? We've got, a, we've got a technology that works. So what we did is we looked at PAD for a kind of, a, it, and this is a, a desktop evaluation where we looked at a 20 million gallon a day facility um, with uh, primaries, uh, BNR, and a couple different approaches to solids at, um, off the system, both with and without THP and with and without pad, um, or uh, deammonification looking at the side stream, trying to look at what, where are the cutoffs here and what makes sense when. Um, let's go to the next slide. So some of our assumptions, we did this on a life cycle cost basis. 20-year um, uh, life cycle assumption, power is about eight cents a kilowatt hour, 
and about 30 bucks a, a week. Well, actually, it's about uh, 50 bucks when you add up hauling and disposal costs per wet ton um, on uh, for a facility. And obviously, that changes depending on where you're at. Next slide. Um, so what we did first without THP in the process where we got just uh, anaerobic digestion followed by pad or with Animox and uh, The pad system was the most expensive because it did need it does need a larger tank that 10-day SRT tank after anaerobic digestion if you're going to build that um, I, I should point out that if you've got, if you're going to do uh, biosolids equalization or storage ahead of uh, dewatering anyway at your plant, that relative cost goes down quite a bit. Um, so it was a little bit higher, but the NPV value was essentially identical uh, between these uh, ones with uh, both PAD and Animox coming out a little bit less than no side stream treatment at all. Um, and Animox coming out $100,000 less. <laughs> um, with THP, it, uh, um, again, the capital costs of uh, side stream treatment was a little bit higher, but essentially the same between PAD and Animox. Uh, the MPV, though, however, went down significantly with the PAD uh, in that particular case um, as a result of uh, the energy and uh, uh, savings associated with it and biosolid savings mostly. So what we found is that PAD is really competitive with deammonification on both capital and operating costs um, but if existing tankage can be used um, instead of the greenfield facility evaluation PAD becomes a clear lower cost alternative, even on a capital point. Uh, what, we, what we found is PAD is much simpler to operate and control than deammonification. Um, yes, you do have to focus on and make sure that the, it's running well uh, in both cases, but PAD is a simple on-off aeration cycle where deammonification has a number of aspects that have to be watched in interactions with dewatering that you have to be careful about as you're running that. So depending on your local conditions, PAD can have a lower NPV and uh, might be something that you want to consider at your facility. Uh, higher biosolids disposal benefits the PAD process. Higher power would benefit deammonification. Next. So uh, the two other plants that uh, PAD has just recently been started up with, as Sadir alluded to, um, is the Northern Treatment Plant at Denver, Colorado. Uh, this is a, a CH2M design on a DBE plant, and the main drivers for that technology was side stream nitrogen removal, struvite stabilization, and the potential for dewatering benefits. Uh, the Boulder treatment plant in Boulder, Colorado was actually designed by Corolla uh, in conjunction with um, the city of Boulder there. And CH had been brought on to assist with the startup as that's been uh, going through the system. The main drivers for that technology was to use uh, existing infrastructure effectively, side stream nitrogen removal, the potentials for reduced disposal costs, stabilizing struvite and uh, potential, the potential for dewatering benefits. Next slide. Go ahead, Bruce. Okay, um, so um, I've been uh, uh, told to ask a question here. The slide isn't advancing yet, Elena. Oh, I'm sorry, because I'm working on the poll. Okay. <laughs> okay, there we go. So we've got a poll on this one here. Um, so what, uh, from what we've been talking about, um, what benefit associated with this technology is the most attractive to you? Um, the options we were giving you is reduce disposal costs uh, because of the higher VSR, uh, addressing the nitrogen impact um, uh, from dewatering recycles, uh, addressing the phosphorus impact uh, um, from dewatering recycles, struvite stabilization, so you don't have those maintenance issues, the potential for improved dewaterability, odor control in your biosolids, or simplicity of operation. 
So the responses are coming in, Bruce, and then uh, I'll, I'll wait another uh, 30 seconds and then uh, we'll share it so you can discuss that. Okay. It's getting pretty close, 10 more seconds. Okay. And there is the result. Well, it's awful similar to Sadir's uh, 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 <laughs> poll there. <laughs> yeah, very similar. So mm -hmm. I, I'm getting also additional questions, guys, in addition to our questions that we created based on, on polling. And uh, so keep having them coming in. There is another uh, summary segment also from Bruce. Uh, and then I would go back and uh, I would uh, sort out the questions based on who would answer them. And uh, so that's what I'm doing right now, tallying all the questions. So if you have any additional questions, please send them in because I'm going to start asking the speakers in a few minutes. Go ahead, Bruce. So uh, in summary, um, can you advance the slide there, Elena? You don't see the summary? Now I do, now I do, okay. okay. So um, in summary, PAD has a wide range of benefits depending on the uh, operation of your anaerobic digester facility and your site specific conditions. We got 10, well, I guess we put 30 in here, but we could put 40 in there on, on a good day. Uh, for additional VS destruction, uh, depending on your wastewater characteristics. Um, reduce maintenance at your facility if you have struvite issues in dewatering and uh, centrate handling or filtrate handling. Um, the, uh, the side stream nitrogen removal of the pad process is actually significantly better than even the Animox um, and um, has some uh, nice applicability for reducing those impacts on, on your mainstream. That potential for nitrifier bioaugmentation um, uh, is, is really nice for us cold weather plants, since I'm in Colorado. Um, improved biosolids dewatering and reduced odors. Um, we've uh, uh, found the potential for all of these, improved uh, quite a few of these as well in, in current designs and operation. Next. So, um before we go through all the questions, I just wanted to make sure um, some of you asked where would a copy of this presentation be, and it would be at the utilitiesofthefuture.com website. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the upcoming webinars are leading into the National Biosolids, which is April 8th. Um, we will be there, Bruce is gonna be there. And uh, these are the additional topics that we have. So if you were at this webinar, you'll be invited. But uh, just, uh, just as a reminder again, on this website is where we had the other two webinars and also the workshops that we did in 2015 focusing on utilities of the future. So with that being said, um, I, I've got a number of good questions and I'm gonna start with Sudhir. Um, how long does struvite stay crystalline in dewatering before dissolving? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, struvite is very stable. It, in fact, it's uh, considered a slow release form of, uh, of phosphorus. So, so it's, not, it's not something that one needs to worry about dissolving right away. Uh, in, in fact, its main attribute is its uh, ability to dissolve so slowly that it's actually a, a, a good form of uh, fertilizer. Okay. What magnesium level is required? So uh, uh, if, if you look at uh, struvite, uh, the chemical formula struvite is magnesium, ammonium, phosphate. And uh, it, it, it's usually one mole of magnesium with one mole of ammonium and one mole of phosphate. And so depending on, uh, it's, re it's really ma magnesium is the limitation for formation of struvite. And, uh, and, 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 and so depending on how you manage the dewatering, uh, so, the, uh, so the magnesium is the limiting uh, 
uh, element and uh, it's needed for biological phosphorus removal, it's needed for struvite formation, it's also needed for good dewatering. And so depending on how much struvite is uh, being formed um, in, in the digesters as well as how much, uh, uh, or, or how much struvite you desire in the digesters or how much uh, uh, biological phosphorus removal uh, you, you, you desire in, in those digesters, uh, you, you need to add the magnesium in that same molar uh, ratio. Okay, this one is for Bruce. Do you have problems with um, hydrogen sulfate coming out of the pad? Uh, actually, no. Um, the pad process uh, with the on-off aeration is actually run specifically to be either aerobic or anoxic. And so um, the, we, we actually do not see any uh, sulfides coming off of the either the cake from the pad process or the off gas. I, I did the typical guy thing and I stuck my head underneath the lid at Spokane County and tried to get a good whiff of what was coming off of there. And it, it was, it just smelled like activated sludge. Okay. Um, the, there's two specific questions related to Spokane. Um, why did the facility not remove the covers? And if, they didn't go go ahead and answer that and okay so we we had covers at spokane county because they had very stringent odor control requirements it's right next to a major road and while um us so us wastewater folks think uh activated sludge smells great not everybody agrees with us so um we did cover the uh the pad tank there uh for primarily odor control reasons. I think we had to hit a, a 5DT at the fence line there, so. So what, I know you showed slides about this cost savings and payback at Spokane. Do you have a good idea, ballpark, if that actually was at a timeline? I mean, I guess the... We, we, we didn't actually do a payback in time. This was, Spokane County was a, a greenfield plant and it was actually a relatively easy thing to decide to do because they had required us as part of the RFP to have a 10-day storage tank uh, in the design anyway. So it was actually simply just a, a matter of converting that to a pad tank in aerobic storage instead of anaerobic. Um, it was pretty inexpensive to do and obviously gave a number of benefits. Okay, so this one is about the toxins. Uh, maybe Bruce, you can take that. What are the relative impacts on the air toxins and climate change gas emissions? We have not looked. Uh, so the, the air off the pad tank, as I said, is essentially like air off an aerobic digester, or a well-operated aerobic digester, or an activated sludge plant. Um, so we have not seen any toxics uh, or uh, anything like that coming off the pad off gas. Uh, but we also haven't you know, specifically tested for those items. Um, similarly, we have not yet done any greenhouse gas testing like uh, N2O coming off the pad tank and compared that relative to doing it in the uh, aerobic in the bioreactor system. Um, Sadir and I and a few others are talking about trying to get a research program put together to answer some of these more detailed questions that uh, uh, we just don't know right now on, on that aspect. So on that note, Sudhir, uh, this one is for you. How much of the ammonia is removed through stripping through aeration versus biological uptake? Actually, I can answer that one. Okay. Uh, sorry, Sudhir, I'm going to take that one. Take it, take it. We actually did test for ammonia coming off the pad tank, and there was none detectable uh, coming off. So it, there was almost no stripping going on. Okay. Um, are there any references with benefits to pea removal? Um, and explain what they are significant. I know both of you can answer that, so... Yes, pick. Well, I, I'll take a first shot on it. I'll let uh, Sidir pile on. 
Um, the pad tank itself will stabilize struvite so that you don't have um, struvite problems uh, in your dewatering and centrate. But that's not quite the same as phosphorus precipitation, you know, like you would get off of, um, you know, an OSTAR process or something like that. Uh, so um, that would be an additional process that would need to be added if you actually wanted to lower your phosphorus levels down below the typicals that you'd get for after stabilization. You want to add to that, Sadir? So, Darren, do you have a comment on that? Uh, I think I think uh, Bruce did a good job there. Okay. So uh, this one is for you, Sudhir, for the natrifier by augmentation. Uh, the question is, is harvesting necessary? And if so, how? So uh, could you repeat that question? For the natrifier by augmentation that you discussed uh -huh. earlier, is harvesting necessary? And if so, how? Uh, I, I don't think uh, there is any deliberate attempt uh, to harvest the nitrifiers. It's just what ends up in the dewatering recycles is 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 what uh, contains also ammonia oxidizing bacteria, and 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 it it provides a seeding effect. Uh, in 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 cold weather conditions, when you have uh, nitrifiers forming in a in a any any process that is outside of the main bioreactors. Uh, those those, those nitrifiers sometimes are beneficial if you don't have enough uh, enough tankage. We actually did a, a pilot test. Uh, Adrian Minetti did, uh, who's now with Clean Water Services, but used to be with us um, out at the city of Meridian, Idaho, on this, and we showed pl pretty clearly that if you had unstable nitrification under cold water conditions and started seeding with a little bit of pad sludge, that it really stabilized nitrification well there. Okay. Uh, another question is, is it realistic to expect 70% volatile solids reduction if you took an anaerobic digester and add a pad to the back end of it? Well, I, I mean, the, the, the general rule of thumb that I use is that we can expect uh, a minimum of about 10% additional VSR over what you're already getting. So, um, you know, if you're, you know, running at 50% BSR now in your anaerobic digester, yeah, you could go up to 60%, I would expect, with PAD. Um, so it's, it's those types of benefits that uh, we're, uh, that I, I expect to see out of this. Okay. And uh, it also depends, it also depends on how, what your volatile solid is going in is. If, uh, if you have a very, um, a high SRT, uh, uh, you know, bioreactor, and and so you you're going in at a, at a lower volatile solids into your anaerobic digester. Uh, you're you're not going to be able to get get that much out. Uh, but if if you have a high volatile solids uh, sludge going into your process, you can certainly start looking at some some high overall VSR. Okay, this is another one you guys can choose who answers. How do you treat the gas off of the pad process now that it isn't producing methane? Well, it's the, the pad, I mean, is an aerobic anoxic process. So there's a little bit of methane from anaerobic digestion, but there, there's, you know, there's really not that much there. And we never let the pad go anaerobic enough that we create methane in it, just the, nature of how it's run. And what's the minimum detention time? I know you answered that for the pad, but if you if you had a look at minimum SRT, what would that be for the aerobic section? It depends a lot on your goals. Um, what we found is you can get decent you can get decent BSR down to five days or so. It's a fairly linear decrease though. Um, and you get you get less and less ability to uh, actually remove nitrogen as well as you lower your SRT there. So I, I usually consider about five days the lowest I'd ever want to consider running a pad process. 
Okay, um, this one is about the recycle from the aerobic or the centrate back to the anaerobic. What is the expected effluent for TN and total phosphorus when if you install on the back end of it a pad? Well, I can give you numbers from our current operating plants. Um, you saw the Spokane numbers in one of the slides where they were running less than 50 uh, TIN, so that's ammonia plus nitrate. Um, recently, they started running it a little bit higher because they, uh, for various operational reasons. Um, uh, both NTP and Boulder are both still in startup uh, out of that. And generally what I say is you can run pad processes up to as high as 100 to 200 ammonia if you want and still get stable operation. And typically when you're running at the higher ammonias, that means your, your nitrates are uh, near, you know, are less than 10 or 20 milligrams per liter. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Bruce, uh, Bruce uh, they may be also asking in the mainstream process. Yes, that's true. And, the, and then they are also re asking a question if there is recycle from the aerobic to the anaerobic. Uh, either either recycle from biosolids or centrate. So it was actually two different questions that they asked. Do you want to hit the recycle? Give me a break uh, there, Sudhir. <laughs> you, 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 you hit the effluent TN and TP and then I'll do the recycle. Okay, <laughs> okay. So uh, TP, as we talked about, you know, uh, the pad itself doesn't change it a whole lot. So if, if you're not doing anything else, I would expect you drop your TP across the pad, you know, 50 milligrams per liter or so, as compared to your anaerobic digester. If a typical anaerobic is 300 to 500, you know, the pad might drop it by 50 orthophosphate, uh, unless you do something else to try and precipitate more out of it, which got a nice big tank to do it in. So there's there are options there. Uh, I think, uh, uh, what, what does Spokane do in terms of its final effluent, nitrogen and phosphorus? Well, I think that's... Uh, oh, okay. So um, uh, the OP, the TP coming out of Spokane is actually 0.05. Uh, we've got a 0.05 seasonal limit. Uh, so I think they average right around 0.04, give or take a little bit. So pretty low phosphorus coming out. TN wise, um, there isn't a TN limit um, out at Spokane, but they are targeting to go, I know Adam's on the call right now, the, the lead operator, but I don't think he can talk. <laughs> um, Unfortunately, I can't get him on. <laughs> uh, so I, I don't know what their current TN is coming out, but I would expect it'd be in the 10 to 15 milligram per liter range. Okay, and I'll, I'll take the uh, recycling of sludge. Uh, uh, I, I do not know whether uh, any of these plants uh, put in a recycle. Uh, what we did evaluate was a recycle of sludge from the aerobic back to the anaerobic to, to try and cycle uh, the solids uh, between an uh, anaerobic and aerobic uh, uh, digestion process and back back and forth. and uh, And, uh, by doing that, uh, that was when we uh, evaluated uh, and saw an increase in VS destruction uh, move up from 65 to 70 percent. And so, so if uh, if that's something that uh, you'd like to consider, uh, it, uh, it's 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 a possibility as well. But 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 the cycling of sludge between the anaerobic and aerobic was when, uh, 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 at least in the in the Bench scale analysis, we were able to get up to 70. And uh, Bruce, uh, I don't know if uh, you installed any of that in your full scale facilities. Actually, both Spokane and NTP have that capability uh, uh, right now. We, we haven't got to uh, exploring that like I'd like to yet, but uh, it's both can do it for exactly the reasons you said. Okay, uh, this is a very clear yes or no. Does PAC qualify for Class A? I think we need to respond to clear the air on that one. No. No. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, 
Hey, Dad, go ahead. You can give the depth, uh, Sudhir. <laughs> it was yeah. no. I was going to answer no, but we can. If you want to elaborate, Sudhir, that's good. Uh, it, it all depends on uh, what is preceded by. If, if you have a Class A process preceding uh, the, the PAD, you can certainly uh, uh, get Class A. Uh, the intent of the PAD in its, in its current form, form is really to get nitrification. And nitrification is inhibited by high temperatures. So, so if, if the PAD itself is preceded by a Class A process, you can have a Class A process downstream of it. But, but it's not intended to do a Class A. So would you comment on the air and energy requirements that's expected in the lower alpha? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, the guy and, that asked it is very good. <laughs> <laughs> I was tempted to tell you who it is, actually, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite all right. Um, the uh, lower alpha that you get in the pad process is why it's not as efficient as Animox is on overall energy usage. So, um, you know, if you have really high power costs, uh, that might not be, uh, and low disposal costs, uh, that might not be a good option for you. But uh, it's, it, as you saw in that 20 MGD uh, plant comparison there, it's, it's not a slam dunk either way. Yes, the pad uses a little bit more energy than Animox, but uh, it's, it's not a one trick pony either. Okay, we're, we're out of time on the questions. Um, if you guys asked and we did not respond, uh, it would actually be documented. Uh, we would get a printout and if we have not responded to your questions, we will. Uh, any final comments, Sudhir and Bruce, for the audience? I guess not. If you guys don't have any, any comments, um, I just would like to thank everybody for actually uh, joining. I, I really think uh, if you, if you want to go over to the uh, website, to the utilitiesofthefuture.com, you would have proceedings. I know some of you asked about that. And then again, I wanted to mention if you were uh, invited to this one, you would automatically get an invite to the other workshops. Our goal is to have um, similar caliber uh, presenters from academia, engineering consultants, and obviously utilities of the future, just like Sudhir. Uh, on behalf of Avivo, I wanna thank you guys for doing a great job. Hopefully this sheds some more light to these technologies and uh, I, I really appreciate all the questions. I know we had a lot of questions and we try to answer as many as possible. And thanks a lot for guys spending an hour with us and it is right on an hour. So uh, with that, I'm gonna stop the webinar and thank you guys very much. <laughs>